Hey folks, this is Adam Gusso, and I'm going to try to answer a question that uh, I have not been asked many times, but it's something I've been thinking about, and I think it's a question that every harmonica player should get an answer to, which is, how did people learn harmonica in the age before YouTube, the age before the internet? Now we've got, you know, uh, I mean, I'm coming up on my 10th anniversary uh, in, a, in less than a month of uh, my first upload to YouTube, and I've got 500-something, 600, 700 videos out there. How did people learn blues harmonica before people like me? That's a good question. Well, obviously, it's been going on for a long time. How did it go on? So I want to talk to you a little bit. It's not. This is going to be a slightly longer video than some of the short, quick hit answer ones that I've got. And I want to float an idea past you, which is, so in the old in the old days, in the in the in the pre-internet days, um, learning blues harmonica depended on face-to-face -face interactions. And in particular, it followed the model of the skilled trades. And this is, uh, I know you've got skilled trades in Europe, we certainly have them in America. And it's a, it's a tripartite, a three-part model, which is to say, um, apprentice, journeyman, and master. And so in the old days, what would happen was somebody who was a uh, usually it worked that the uh, apprentice or the would-be apprentice heard somebody playing and said, I want to learn. Maybe they'd learned a little bit by themselves. In any case, they found the master and they said, teach me. Now, ideally, the master said, uh, I like what you're doing, kid, and I think I can teach you. And then how did it work at that point? Well, I don't think, in the, certainly in the days when it was um, black apprentices and black masters, um, I don't think it worked by somebody saying, so this is the two-hole draw and I'm going to do a whole step bend. It was much more, and, and you can still find this, and it's, it's, it's transracial at this point, you can still find crusty older guys, white and black, who will just say, hey, do this. And they play something. And the kid, the apprentice, tries to do it. And either can or can't, often not a whole lot of explanation going on. And there was a certain kind of hazing element, and I'm going to read you something in a moment that sort of shows that at work in a very pointed way between two very famous um, deceased players whose names will be immediately familiar to you. But that's the way it worked. And, and, it, and it, that can still work that way, it can still work that way, which is, say, the sort of the transmission of knowledge from the master to the apprentice. Now, an apprentice, of course, is somebody who, in the, in the martial arts, cleans up the dojo. It's the one who, done, who might, he might be the one driving around the master. In, in my case, with Sterling McGee, Mr. Satan, I had the car, I drove my, you know, the guitar master around. Um, might be somebody who runs errands. Sometimes it involved payment in, in kind, it involved money basically, in, in, in some cases, but in some cases it didn't. Um, let me actually, I'm going to put on my glasses and I'm going to read you something that's quite astonishing. And it's from uh, Living Blues magazine uh, some years ago. And it's, uh, it's, it's about how Sonny Boy Williamson taught Junior Wells how to play blues harmonica. So uh, check it out. This is what Wells said. And this is classic old school blues harmonica teaching. Um, it is not kind and it's not gentle. Uh, Junior Wells said, I had asked him, Sonny Boy, about teaching me something, and he say, where's your harp at? I took it out, and I showed it to him. He took it, and threw it on the ground, and stomped it. He said, that's not a harmonica. He said, you got to go get one, and you got to buy me a drink. I say, okay. So I went up there to the drugstore, and I got me a marine band, and I come back, and I brought him half a pint of whiskey. 100 proof. Granddaddy. He said, no. What do I look like to you? Some little boy or something or another? And I said, no. He said, I need a fifth. I went and got that fifth, Junior Wells says, and brought it back to him. And he took the drink of it, big drink of it. Drink him some more. And he sat down and went to blow in the harp. He said, you know what? I say, what? He said, now I'm going to show you one more time. He, oh, he said, he, so he blew it and I tried to play it. He said, you know what? I say, what? He said, now, I'm going to show you one more time. And he did, and I did the same thing. He said, you know what? You ain't never going to learn how to do nothing or do nothing with, how to be nothing or do nothing with your dumb ass. And you know what else? You see that bottle of whiskey you bought? And I say, um, he, he say, you bought it, right? And you know what else? You see that bottle of whiskey you bought? He say, you bought it, right? I say, yeah. And he say, 
in its mind. And he took his knife out and licked it and laid it down there by his bottle of whiskey and said, and if you touch it, you little bastard, you, I'll cut your damn throat. Now get up and get the hell away from me. Man, nothing ever hurt me before like that before in my life. I told him, you just doing this to me because I'm a kid. And Junior was about 10, 11, 12. But if I was a grown man, you wouldn't do that to me. He said, well, I did it. Now get out of my face. I cried. That, that hurt me to my soul. I said, Lord Jesus, and ooh, man, I was more determined then I was going to do it. And I went on back to Chicago, you know, and I met the original Sonny Boy, John Lee. And then I met little Walter and all those people, and then I started learning how to do it right. And it was down to Teresa's, Teresa's Lounge, 48th in Indiana, in the basement. After Sonny Boy come to Chicago, he came down there one evening for the Blue Monday thing we were doing down there, and he come up there, in there, sitting at the bar. Hey, Junior, come here, man. I'm going to buy you a drink. I said, let me tell you one thing. Don't mess with me. Just leave me alone. He said, I know what's wrong with you. You mad with me about what I said to you and the way I treated you a long time ago, right? And I said, yeah. He said, well, listen at you now. You learned how to play, and you're doing it right. I'm proud of you. He said, now just think. If I had a babied you around, you still wouldn't be blowing the harmonica. Do that make sense to you? And I'll be damned. It just run through my head, just like that. Said, boom. He's right. I said, you're right. He said, well, come on and have a drink then. Now treat the next son of a bitch that come up and tell you to show him something. Treat him like I treated you. Ha! <laughs> the dumb son of a bitch will learn something then. I was proud of him then, you know, because he was right about it. I probably wouldn't have. Um, so that's how it worked uh, back in the day. That's one way that it worked, which was uh, pretty rough. Um, and it was, uh, it was black men teaching black men. Now, the interesting question is, what happened when white players began to come into the blues scene in the 1960s? Um, well, and the 1970s. And what's interesting was you began to get these interracial partnerships where you would have an African-American master like George Harmonica Smith and you'd have a white apprentice like William Clark. Um, and, and by the way, the other way that this worked again in the pre-YouTube that's era, that's what I'm talking about, the pre-internet era, is that part of the deal was that the master gets the apprentice up on stage. Um, you know what the word protege means, by the way? It's a very important concept. The protege, prote protege literally in French, protege means protected. So the protege is not just the young whippersnapper who's pretty good, but he's the one who the master protects. Very interesting idea. So, and maybe physically, back, maybe back then it was physically, even though there was this hazing element, maybe also you're just like, don't mess with my boy. Um, and so the protege is the one who protects, and, and so the masters would bring their apprentices on stage with them, and bit by bit they pull them up to the point where the apprentices become journeymen. They're ready to go off on their own. This happened to Honey Boy Edwards as a blues guitar player when he teamed up with Big Joe. Um, masters pull, they accept apprentices, they pull apprentices up until they become journeymen, then the journeymen go out on their own. Well, anyway, this, this morphed as you begin to get black masters and white apprentices. And... Um, this was all happening in the, during the civil rights era and the sort of post, the sort of aftermath of the civil rights era when Martin Luther King's concept of beloved community, you know, the sort of true interrelatedness of black and white in a sort of human family. And I found some amazing photos of, you know, the partnerships, Kim Wilson hanging out with the Muddy Waters Band and, uh, and William Clark hanging out with George Harmonica Smith. And there's a kind of thing that you see that's, it's, it's, it's a little bit different than, than when it was black fathers and black sons. There's a, there's a, it's almost like because there was so much tension, you know, there's normally a kind of Oedipal tension between father and son, but it's almost like the black fathers and white sons said, you know what, we can't be killing each other, we can't be mocking each other, we can't be intimidating each other the way that Sonny Boy intimidated Junior Wells. It's almost like it's got to be a little kinder and gentler. Now, I may be wrong about this. Paul Osher can tell some of these stories. Um, he, he talks about being in a car with Muddy and his band, and everybody in the car had a gun, and we're pointing it at each other. And you know, and Osher was there. Everybody's pointing it at him too, because everybody has a gun, and that's how you, that's how you carry on a conversation when things get hot and heavy with a gun. Hopefully, nobody gets shot. 
Um, so what happens? So you get that era. You get that era in the 70s. You get the, the, the Austin scene with Antones, and you get Kim Wilson and the Fabulous Thunderbirds backing up Muddy Waters. You get Muddy Waters saying he's the best I've heard since Little Walter. You get this apprenticeship thing with people, again, kind of being on stage with each other. And, and that's so important. That's how the music is learned. It's not just learned sitting in hotel rooms trading licks. It's not learned by James Cotton doesn't sit with Deke. And there's another example of an interracial partnership. James Cotton and my friend Deke Harp, Deke was his apprentice. He drove him around. He lived in his, lived in his, uh, in his basement. Um, and you end up getting on stage with somebody and you sort of learn the music that way. You're hearing the really good stuff, but you're also learning the life. You're learning how to, how to conduct yourself on stage. And I think that, as much as anything, is what is lacking today. Um, even as I've helped and lots of people are out there kind of spreading knowledge, that interpersonal thing is really missing. So what happens? Well, this is when my own story sort of starts, because I come into the scene, I get a harmonica in the fall of 74, and I'm try I want to learn, and I don't know any, I, I haven't seen live blues. I don't know any blues harmonica players. So I do what we all did back then. You talk to anybody in the 70s. How did you learn how to play blues harmonica? And they point to a specific book, and it's called Blues Harp. Now, this copy is not an original. I, I looked at it, but if we sort of page it open, that, by the way, is the Reverend Dan Smith on the cover. It took me a while to realize that. And he's actually holding the harp the way I do, this sort of two-handed thing. That's Dan Smith, who was a, an amazing player. Um, but if I, if I open this, um, uh, open this, okay, Blues Harp. So there's a, a wonderful photo of a, a Marine band. That was the what everybody had, Blues Harp, by Tony Little Son Glover. And of course, when I first got this, I said, who the heck is Tony Glover? And um, so it's, it's, it's published in 1965, but 984 means uh, in uh, September of 1984, this particular one was published. So this is not an original, though, God, it's had a lot of use. Um, and he's got, I'm going to put on my glasses so I can see all the stuff in his table of contents, but this is what we all learn from. So um, blues harp, some history, choosing your acts. That was, you know, fascinating. Choosing your acts. Kind of, that's the lingo of serious musicians. Cross harp, didn't know what that was, but that you'll learn from this. Bending notes, third position, fourth position, chromatic. A taste of harp styles, very important. A taste of harp styles. Sonny Terry, Sonny Bo Williamson one, Sonny Bo Williamson two, Little Walter Jimmy Reed. So the first thing that should be obvious is that Tony Glover knew what the good stuff was. Solo or lead harp versus accompanying harp care. Um, old time tips. Okay, Tony Glover himself, who was Tony Glover? Well, he was kind of, he had that, what I'd call the white hipster look from the mid-60s. Tony Little Son Glover, photo by, I guess that was his uh, wife or woman, Tony. Um, anyway, so this is what we learned from. And it was, well, there's, I mean, it starts with the good stuff, with Sonny Boy and, uh, King Biscuit Time, so Sunny Boy Outdoors. That was my first exposure to, this must be the serious shit. Um, back a ways, some history and some people. Um, and uh, Junior Wells, God, what's this? Got something in the book. This is one of the early things I put together for my students. Blues harp jamming and classic cuts tape. So I, I uh, when I was teaching, anyway. All the players he, he focuses on are African-American, um, Jimmy Reed, um, Little Walter, Sonny Boy, Sonny Boy One, there's Sonny Terry. So that immediately gave you a sense, and this is what's interesting, Gus, uh, Free Lewis, Gus Cannon, and Memphis Willie. So this, let me, let me uh, come back to you. So what was going on here? Well, the first thing is, of course, this is distance learning. So when I think about myself as an internet harmonica purveyor of knowledge and teacher, first thing I do is I say, Blues harp, Tony Glover. That was distance education. It was a book. No actual person like like Junior Wells learning from Sonny Boy or uh, George Smith teaching William Clark. Something had happened. There was a sort of distance suddenly. But there's still an older guy, and in this case it was Tony Glover, who's cooler than the student, who seems to have a, a, a per purchase on a kind of esoteric knowledge that the student desperately wants to learn. So it's interesting what survives and what doesn't. Now, he can't reach out and slap, as I did one time in one of my videos, slap, slap me across the face so you're not paying attention. 
He can't pull out a knife, right, and, and, and say, or, or say, go buy me something. Doesn't make demands that same way. So something's missing. But a lot of people who wouldn't have been exposed to blues harmonica otherwise were exposed to it thanks to that one book. I mean, there were other harmonica instruction books. There was one by Blackie Shackner that I bought. But blues harp, I mean, that was it. <laughs> that, was, that was the book. Talk to anybody from back then. It was a great book. Um, all right. So what happens at that point? Well, remember, this whole time there are always people in local scenes who are mentoring people. So it's not as though Blues Harp totally pushes away the, the old school mentoring process, the, in the you know, intra-racial or trans-racial, doesn't really matter. There are still people pulling people on stage and showing them how to play. That's still, and that's still going on now. I think that if there's one point to this video, it's that if you're really, and please listen to me, if you're really serious about learning blues harmonica, then you might want to go and actually find a living, breathing blues harmonica player who can teach you something. Um, you can take all you want from my videos, but you really, the, you, need to, you need to find a master um, and, and make it real and make it reciprocal. And in a funny way, I did that with uh, somebody who may well see this video, Brandon Bailey, who was a 16-year-old kid in Memphis and saw one of my videos on Whammer Jammer about nine years ago um, and, and uh, commented in the, in, the, um, in the comments section. He said, you're playing that third lick wrong. And I said, who the hell is this? But I ended up going up to Memphis. He was in a star search competition and we ended up kind of becoming master and apprentice and he's a journeyman now and I produced an album by him. So interestingly enough, the old model of blues harmonica education hasn't been completely displaced. It's still there. It's still available to be activated. And so I would ask you to think about your life and think about whether if you're really serious about this instrument, there might be some way. It doesn't have to be an old black guy. It doesn't have to be an old white guy. It could be whoever the elder in your musical scene is. They, if they play harmonica, or even if they, maybe they don't play harmonica, but you could be jamming with them and they could be teaching you stuff. It's very important. Um, and that sort of brings us up to the modern age. One more step, I think, is after Tony, Tony Glover's book, Blues Harp, there's a point at which people begin to work up videos and um, like DVDs and CDs. So there was a, there was a, a, a an instructional method by, uh, not a method, but a series of CDs by Paul Butterfield and Jerry Portnoy. Um, and bef that, so that's sort of what moves into the 90s and early 2000s. And that's sort of what's there in the, in the period before YouTube comes along. Um, John Gindick, of course, Blues Harmonica Education has changed as a result of what Gindick did. He was one of the people who had, uh, he, I mean, he sold a zillion instructional books. So he was one of the people who sort of took the Tony Glover model and broadened it in a, in a big and important way. And he was also um, somebody who innovated in the early 2000s by putting on his blues harmonica jam camps. And that was his term. Nobody else was using that term. It's his, uh, not quite patented, but it should be, blues harmonica jam camps, where you get a bunch of people to come together into a community. Um, J.P. Allen has done some of this, and I've done some of this with Hill Country Harmonica. So, and understand what's happening when you do that is you're trying to make the human-to-human -human connection happen as, with the help of the Internet, because, of course, you're advertising on the Internet. Um, you're sharing videos on the Internet afterwards and sharing photos. But it's still about human-to-human -human transmission. Anyway, I've gone on much too long. I hope this video kind of brings you up to date and it and answers the question, how did blues harmonica education work in the days before the internet? So you didn't ask, but thanks for asking. See you down the road.